The premise of tonight is this is a listening event. We asked our many of our elected officials beforehand to tell us what they think the top legislative budget priorities for this upcoming year should be. And they offered those to us. I've had them up, um, and I, hopefully you saw it as you were coming in. Tonight, though, they're here to listen. So what they want to hear from you is what you think the priority should be. You will be given a couple minutes to speak. I'll go over the ground rules in a second. But um, this is your opportunity to sort of maybe put something on the table that hasn't been, or to reinforce an issue that you think is really important. We will be recording tonight. And after this, we're going to look at the collective input from the citizens who share tonight. And then, um, so we'll be able to see X number of people that this issue so we can begin to see some relevance. Uh, I'd like to welcome our elected officials here tonight. Thank you for coming. We have Assemblyman Crouch and Assemblywoman Lopardo. Senator Akshar is here. County Executive Garner. We also have Mark Whalen, who is our minority leader. Thank you, Mark. Greg Dini is here, who is our JC mayor. And Rich David, our Binghamton mayor. So thank you for coming. Um, I got tonight Mr. Whalen's um, priorities too. I apologize for not having them up, but I do want to share those in addition to what you see. The priorities that he listed is um, one, refilling the dissipated BC fund balance. Thank you. Um, raise the age funding and procedure, raise the age funding and procedures. And the last one is monitoring the programs that we put in place to address the opioid crisis. So here's how tonight's gonna work. I get to stop talking and you get to start talking very soon. We collected a list of names when you came in and so we're gonna go in that order of people who um, are going to speak. We're asking that everyone take two minutes to share your thoughts and um, and when you have 30 seconds remaining, our friends right here are going to hold up a white card that has a 30 on it. And when you have 15 seconds remaining, the 15 will go up, and then finally they have a nice little card that gently reminds you to stop. <laughs> um, our purpose here is that everybody has a voice, and so that's why we're asking you to think about what you want to say in advance and be concise. Um, so that everyone who wants to speak gets an opportunity to. Once we go through the list, we will um, then open the floor if anyone else would like to share additional information. So if you didn't sign up to speak, but you're so inspired to do so after hearing other people, you will be afforded the opportunity to do so. Um, and then the only thing that we ask is that you don't direct questions to our elected officials tonight. Um, we're really just sharing, we're collecting notes, we're not putting anyone um, on the spot. Can we agree to that? Mm -hmm. All right, are we ready to roll? Yes? I was just like a little eager to do the information that you collected. So we're going to share it out with all of the elected officials. And that's it, you can just look at it? Yeah, have a plan to do anything with it. Well, our hope is that they'll take that information into consideration. Um, and we also um, could share that with um, our news folks who are here. I think we talked about that, Doug, is that right? Um, so there's an opportunity for people to see how the event went and, and what, what was weighed in. Thank you. Thanks. OK. So. Um, I'm going to list the first person who's speaking and then I'll tell you who's on deck so the next person can be ready. Um, and then this is where I should have worn my glasses. Are you sharing yours with me? <laughs> Cyril's? Did I read that right? Cyril's. Cyril's. Thank you. Charles. 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 And then next is going to be Roger Failing. Excellent. Look, you could pass the mic. You're on. Hi. Hi. Okay. Right, right from here. Oh, okay. Sure, if you'd like to stand, okay. you're ready to roll. I, mean, I, I just thought I'd share with this. I'm not a speaker. Oh, you probably know that already. Um, 
Years ago, I, I put up a, I made up a little thing here. Years ago, I, I uh, made up a sheet that sort of, uh, I thought, addressed some of the issues that we face individually. We're all uh, endowed with a brain. I, I know we are. <laughs> God gave us a brain. But a lot of people follow others without thinking. They say, well, so-so must know what he's talking about because he has been educated very well, and he must know that I don't have to think anymore. I can just go along and follow along behind him. So what I'm trying to do here is just show that it's not a good, not a good idea. Uh, the truth is not always recognized as such, must stand on its own merits, depend on indi the independent thought process. And I don't think people really think about that very much. And uh, educators, there are, uh, can part be educators, fear of TV and radio, cry peer group pressure and professionalism sometimes get in the way of uh, individual thought. In other words, people don't take the time to actually use their own brain to research uh, some of this stuff, okay? And what's at stake is our freedom, our country, and our culture as a whole, okay? What I'm looking at here is educators may not be as well educated as, they, as you think they are, okay? So that's why I'm trying to, my, I don't read too good, what's up? <laughs> and a lack of quality teaching material, most government or state teachers colleges concerning our Christian roots and cultural heritage, the parcel quote from the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the Creator with certain and alienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among, among men. The public school system does not recognize God or a creator. So you can read all this stuff. Thank you. You did give handouts. There's a Outside, literature yeah. right there. On the table. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Better hand that to me now. <clears throat> Roger, you're on. Yes, I better get it quick here because I have so much stuff here that I'd like to talk about in very limited time to do so. And Peter, Leslie, uh, Balzani, you're next. I'd, I'd just like to thank you for having this venue so we could get in here and speak. And I promise that I will try not to be uh, facetious or petulant in my remarks. Uh, I hope Donna, you didn't drag your motorcycle down here for see. I just arrived at Donna. Uh, I am very, very disturbed about the fact that the New York State is $4 billion in debt. This was on today's uh, newspaper, which I brought, and there was an article that said, Triangle taxpayers are charged too much. I got news for the people on Triangle. Uh, we're all charged too much as far as I'm concerned in the state. Uh, New York budgets, millions in new taxes and fees. I'm sure we're all looking forward to that. <laughs> you know, this progressive state is almost tantamount to socialism anymore. I have to pay for things that I don't utilize. Uh, my school taxes alone, we're talking, I see it up there. I retired in 1992, my school taxes have gone up by 62%. I attend all school board meetings in Endicott, and I have talked to the good doctor down there in charge and uh, indicated to her that I did algorithms uh, when I worked for IBM that weren't as complicated as the uh, things that they come up with to raise my taxes. I see that they may uh, freeze school taxes for seniors was another article in the paper. I'm 81 years old. I haven't had a kid in school in over 30 years, and I'm still paying school taxes. Then I see there's another one where they're saying, here is, uh, uh, that, that really disturbed me, was about the libraries here. The libraries bring drag queens into story time. And uh, the young lady below says uh, the event uh, aims to celebrate community diversity. How about that bring us some nudists in and have them uh, talk to the kids in the bubble? Who's, uh, who wants to 
Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Amy Fleming is next. Amy. Oh, it's you in the next. Uh, yeah, I, my pr priorities, um, I'm going to get priorities and somehow we can achieve it, not just say that they're bad. Okay, first, I find it interesting that none of our three state legislators had uh, real ethics reform as a concern, as a top priority, okay? Um, my, that's my top priority, and how to achieve it is introduce and pass legislation for term limits, three term limits for all executive and legislative representatives. Public service was not meant to be a lifetime occupation. We cannot longer afford to have people in power for 30 years who think they are kings and queens and can do anything they want in our government. Uh, the second, how to achieve it is zero outside income for all executive and legislative representatives. 79,500 plus your daily travel, lodging, food allowances plus extra money to cheer committees, bringing an average income to approximately $90,000 a year is sufficient for a part-time job as far as I'm concerned. And if state elected officials think this is unfair or hard to achieve, I remind them that many hardworking people in our state would love to have that salary. Number, another way to achieve it is stop the gerrymandering of our political districts. This only serves to keep the current legislators in power and reduce our size of our, our state government. One senator and one assembly person for each county, plus one senator and one assembly person for each of the seven boroughs of the metro area in New York City is plenty of representation. This will significantly lower the cost of government and give money for other areas of our concerns. Our second priority is to create a more conducive business climate. How to achieve it? Offer a significant tax break for all small businesses with employees of less than 20 people. Tax breaks for businesses that are only affiliated with universities has not worked. In fact, it has been a financial disaster for New York taxpayers with this prolific collection. And my third one is continued and expanded prevention and treatment of opioid crisis. I uh, commend the county legislature for approving it and hope that they can expand upon it. Well, I have been around for a long time working on a lot of issues, and the one that I worked on the most is health care. And I know that there is a single payer bill in the state legislature, in the state legislature, and um, that's sponsored by Richard Gottlieb. And um, I really would like to encourage everyone here to call you and tell you their health care stories. And um, I really would like to know how you uh, feel about single-payer health care and whether, you, whether you'd be voting for it. Victor Foreman. Oh, I'm sneaking through. Oh, thank you. And next. <coughs> I want to speak about a passion I have. I want to know where they were, where have they gone? Where have the headlines gone? The destruction of our neighbors in Pennsylvania. Where are those headlines? Since December of 2014, when Governor Cuomo put a moratorium on gas drilling in New York, miraculously, those headlines have disappeared. Anthony Ambrafia, a Cornell professor and anti-gas activist, entertained by Albany as an expert in the field of gas drilling, testified in court in 2016 that he had no expertise in that field at all. Yet, because of him, a moratorium has gone through, and because of the activists that he worked with. Uh, we talk about economic development in our area. I strongly believe that natural gas drilling would have brought economic development. It would have brought taxes for our government to use, and it would have brought wealth for our people to celebrate. And there is no destruction like I said, we're in the headlines. There's been no destruction in Pennsylvania. As a matter of fact, uh, Dr. Shaw, the health commissioner who left on April 9th of 2014, had to sign a non-disclosure agreement as he stepped down uh, and moved to California, a state that fracked with his children. Dr. Zucker said he wouldn't let the children he didn't have play near a gas wall. This is the politics we are suffering in New York City. This is the discourse. I have a lot more I want to say, but two minutes isn't a lot. I'd, I'd like to say that just since 2016, five companies have invested $3 billion, excuse me, $300 billion apiece into Pennsylvania gas drilling, into the Marcellus and Unica Shell. Range Resources, Chevron, Console Energy, Rice Energy, and Cabinet 
But New York is missed out because of bad politics, and I think our bad politics need to come to an end, and the people need to be thought of, as well as our property rights. Thank you. Well, more of this. Uh, what I want to talk to you about is corn versus the U.S. Department of Agriculture. This is a case that went before the U.S. Supreme Court. Horn was a ra he raised grapes for raisins, and the federal government took the raisins. <coughs> and commonly, people think that when a government takes property, it only applies to real estate. This is a relatively recent case, and the Supreme Court said we've had it all wrong. When the government takes your property, any property, they have to pay for it. When Governor Cuomo stopped gas drilling in New York State, you could contend that the gas is still in the ground. You could contend the state has every right to regulate a resource. But I don't think you can dispute the fact that what he took was people's ability to lease their property. And I believe New York State should pay landowners, anyone who has ever had a lease, a, a reasonable amount of money for not drilling and for not leasing. It's the right thing to do. And I know a lot, if, the, if gas is so bad, then they should shut it off in every state and county building in the state. That's the first thing. The second thing is that I think that in the state, in the county, maybe the city, to do a better analysis of why things didn't happen. I've never seen that. People report. Reporting is, an ana is not an analysis. It's, it, so I think there should be more of this. I'm looking, I'm running out of time here, uh, of why, why we didn't get contracts. For example, the Mazda Toyota plant that went to Alabama. Okay, the third thing for the opioid addiction, you're never going to solve that problem by just throwing money at it. I think you need a set of volunteers that will go around and give medicine to people with this problem. And, uh, or, and also other medicines. Jeff O'Brien. I want to thank everybody for hosting the event and thank you to the politicians for being here. We really appreciate you sitting down and listening to us. Um, my three priorities would be as follows. Accountability um, is it obligation or willingness to accept responsibility or to account for one's actions. Accountability in government is severely lacking. Backroom deals, pay-to-play schemes, and promotion of self-interest are destroying the foundation of our representative democracies. Politicians must be held accountable for their actions, not only by citizens, but their peers as well. I call on all those in both local and state government to commit to making their meetings and negotiations open and accessible to the people they serve and to hold accountable those in government who use their position for personal and political gain. Number two, small businesses are being inundated with regulations, fees, and taxes that are stifling growth. Government mandates such as reporting requirements, increased minimum wages, and mandatory benefits stifle growth of both the employer and the employee. Small businesses are forced to spend much of their resources on these mandates instead of investing in business development or being competitive. A business climate that limits government intervention will encourage growth, which ultimately benefits both the employer and the employee. Finally, government spending must be reduced. Government can no longer afford to live beyond its means. With an increasing dependent population and a decreasing tax base, the only way governments will be able to afford to provide necessary services is by doing more with less. Many families and small businesses are forced to do more with less every time a new fee is imposed or taxes are raised. It's time government becomes responsible and learns to do the same. Thank you. Mark D? Middle initial D? Mark? <coughs> I'm not sure I can read this fast, so I'm just going to read this, so hopefully I can get through it in the two minutes. Uh, my first thought here, all my thoughts are on economic development. 
Um, looking at the Regional Economic Development Council's most recent report, uh, the 2017 progress report, uh, we've invested 276 million plus of state funding and created only uh, 2,219 jobs. These numbers are directly from uh, their report. Uh, that's over $124,393 per job. Uh, we funded a total of 460 projects in the last six years with a total project value of almost $1.4 billion. However, the total number of jobs created, both created and retained, is only 18,296. So that comes out to about just under uh, $79,000 per job. I know I may be oversimplifying this, but this is directly from page 20 and the two tables that are there. At the same time, uh, in 2015, the Community Foundation of South Central New York uh, commissioned some resources uh, to look at a uh, need in our area. They have a five county area. The research was done by the Horn Research Group. Uh, covered Broome, Shenango, Delaware, Otsego, and Tioga counties. Broome County has the highest number of people living in poverty, almost 17.4%. This is an increase from 2000 when it was only 12.8. The statewide poverty rate is 15.6. The national poverty rate as reported by the U.S. Census Bureau in 2016 was 12.7. Um, more disturbing, of those living in poverty, children are the largest subpopulation affected. 25.3% of children 18 and under in Broome County live in poverty. This also is an increase from 2000 when the number was 15.9. Pockets of high childhood poverty exist in Broome County. For example, in the city of Binghamton, it's as high as 43.3%. Added to this are a group of people that have been characterized as ALEX, Asset Limited Income Constrained Employed. These people who are make more... Um, the Alice people are people who make more than the U.S. poverty level, which is $11,670 for a single adult and $23,850 for a family of four, uh, but less than the basic cost of living. Um, so what we have here, when you combine the people that are living in poverty below the federal poverty level and those that are considered Alice, the working poor, and the stop signs up again, you're looking at almost 43% of the people living in Broome County are categorized there. I had more, I'll have to hand it in. If, there, if time remains. Okay. Right. Speaks, we'll come back. That was a long sentence. That was a long sentence. Thank you. Um, Suzanne Hickok. About 70% of the dedicated educators at community colleges in New York State are part-time employees, most of whom want full-time positions. Unfortunately, our work hours are limited specifically to deny us employer-sponsored health insurance. A side effect of this now standard practice is that we are also denied access to the 10-year public service loan forgiveness program. Through a contract bargained with New York State, part-time faculty at four-year SUNY colleges are eligible for health insurance when they teach six credits a semester. This makes it possible for them to take another job to increase their usable household income and potentially qualify for public service loan forgiveness. In contrast, a part-time SUNY Broome faculty in a single-person household teaching nine credits a semester and earning $11,000 in a second job will have to pay $6,600 for an equivalent plan through New York State of Health. That may cost us only $240 if we do not take a second job. After paying insurance and taxes, we are left with about $1,500 for household use. Someone making student loan payments on the income-based repayment program will see that figure drop to $400 of the $11,000 that they earn. New York State should address this baseless inequity and somehow provide health insurance for their highly educated part-time community college faculty that does not leave us to live on less the income than a minimum wage job while looking forward to a day 20 years down the road when we are recognized for our public service by the IRS presenting us with an income tax bill on the balance of our student loans, which we are finally able to have forgiven. Barbara Mueller. Mueller. I'm messing this up today. Where's those lines? <laughs> so I'm, I guess I'd like to support the um, single payer 
position. I am a social worker with UHS and I go out to the community and go and visit patients at home. And I fortunately and unfortunately I um, had the opportunity to go into some of the poorest homes in our county, many of the homes that you're talking about. And the reality for the working poor, um, some of the elderly who are relying on Medicaid, you can only have an income, a monthly income of around 800, I'm rounding it up, $800 a month in order to be eligible for Medicaid. So if your income is $1,000, you have to have a spend down, which you have to mail you know, $200 plus or minus um, to social services to make you eligible for Medicaid services. And so I have to say to my clients um, things like, well, in order to take the Medicaid uh, transportation, you either need to mail in the $200 or mail in the $200 and then plan to go to the dentist, the eye doctor, and any other doctor's appointments you have in one month. And then mail in the $200 and that'll make you eligible for Medicaid and then you'll get your glasses paid for and then you can take the um, transportation. Because if you have to take a Serafini Medivan, over $100 out of pocket. So there are a lot of needs in this community and I don't know what the impact would be to businesses if the state took up the single payer because that would take insurance off of a business and might help businesses in our state. And I don't know what the impact might be to our medical community because we are having a difficult time retaining the MDs and nurses. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. I want to commend New York State on making some really good progress in breast cancer screening. Um, the law now requires that New York based insurers cover uh, mammograms for all women. And as of 2013, those of us with dense breasts have been getting kind of a confusing letter. NPR says that dense breast letter is kind of dense. Um, but essentially it says your mammal's normal, but you've got dense breasts, you ought to talk to your doctor. That's about 40 to 50% of all women who have these fibrous breasts. I was one of those people and I was not getting the ultrasound. Now the ultrasound actually, um, well, helps, helps to find cancers, it finds, uh, a, a mammogram in a woman with fatty breasts will detect 98% of all cancers, but in a woman with dense breasts or fibrous breasts, it only catches about 48% of those cancers. Um, a diagnostic radiologist, Dr. Susan Drosman, has said it's kind of like looking for a snowball in a blizzard. So the cancers get hidden among the fibrous um, tissue. There are bills pending in both the New York State Senate and Assembly, and I've written to both of our um, folks uh, in the New York Legislature, and we'll be meeting later this month, um, to require insurance to cover both a mammogram and an ultrasound for women with dense breasts. And I encourage all of you to encourage anyone you know who gets that dense breast letter to insist on an ultrasound as well. Thank you so much. Thank you to all the citizens who attended, the elected officials at Brook Community College for putting this on. My name is George Phillips. I'm the regional director for Reclaim New York. I want to talk about three issues. One is the economic development aid that this gentleman mentioned here. As uh, some of you all may not be aware of, my group uh, recently was involved in a lawsuit against the Cuomo administration for not responding for six months for a FOIL request under how money was spent for the Startup New York program. And we've all heard about it and we have seen that it hasn't worked very well. In terms of economic development aid, I know elected officials here are always looking for more, or getting behind projects here, you're elected to represent this area, I certainly respect that, but I would say it's never gonna be enough. The Binghamton Press did a study, $500 million in Southern Tier Economic Development Aid from the Binghamton area, Ithaca, up to Delaware County, Corning and Elmira, over five years, that's only one-tenth of 1% 1 of our economy. So the projects sound good, but what we need is lower taxes across the board, less regulations to try to get this economy going again. Second, mandates. I meet with county, town, local officials, school district, whether they're Republican or Democrat, almost everyone complains about mandates. I have a supervisor who says I hire someone for $30,000 a year. By the time I get done with state mandates, it's about 57,000, almost double the salary for the taxpayers. 
Everyone seems to agree it's a problem. Can we get something done on mandate relief? And I know poverty has been talked about here on the board, and it's a concern hopefully of everyone. I believe it's heavily related to work, and I know those in poverty are struggling to find jobs. There's a job skills gap that this fine institution is trying to help close. But I hope our elected officials could look for ways to help mandate work to the extent possible, because I do believe there's dignity in work, and when people have jobs, good things happen. Thank you so much. Jeanette Beal, does the question mark mean you're not sure that's your name or you're not yeah. sure you want to talk? <laughs> yeah. I'm sure it's talk <laughs> There you go. Um, I'm a member of a group called the Concerned Women of Greater Binghamton, and we as a group are concerned about how the changes in the federal laws and regulations that affect us locally. We're especially concerned about effects on the environment, healthcare, and women's issues um, surrounding contraception and abortion. Our group has met with several of the legislators and would we, we would be very pleased to, to continue the conversation about what can be done locally and what our group can do to help. Thank you. That was fast. Yeah. <laughs> Brianna? Hi everyone. I am with the Let New York Vote Coalition, um, also the founder of Generation Vote, and a member of the Binghamton Indivisible Group. And I'm here today to talk to you about voting reform in New York. New York is facing a democratic crisis. Despite having one of the largest voting populations, New York was ranked 41st to voter turnout in the 2016 presidential election. In the most recent mayoral election, New York City experienced a record low voter turnout of only 21.7%. The abysmally low voter turnout can be attributed to the archaic electoral laws that govern the voter registration process and the administration of voting in our state. According to the Center for American Progress Action Fund, these archaic laws have damaging consequences and cause our state to be ranked 44th out of 51 jurisdictions for the health of our state democracy. For example, New York has the most restrictive change of party affiliation deadline in the country and is one of only 13 states that do not have a form of early voting. Moreover, New York is part of a small cohort of states that do not have same-day registration, automatic registration, or a unified standard or BOE registration procedures. In the 2018 State of the State Address, Governor Cuomo included automatic voter registration, early voting, and same-day voter registration in the Democracy Project. Recently, a bill was introduced by Senator Little, which would allow voters to vote in special and general elections at their local board of elections for a period of 14 days before Election Day. This week, we celebrated the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. Last year, we celebrated the 100th anniversary of the victory of women's suffrage right here in New York. If we were to honor his legacy and the legacy of these brave women who, fought, who risked their lives to fight for the fundamental right to vote, we must take action now by making voter reform a state priority and making the ballot accessible to all New Yorkers. Thank you so much. Rita? Um, I didn't prepare any comments, but um, one thing I did want to talk about is community uh, related. Uh, one of my favorite parts of the community is the Vessel Rail Trail. Every time I'm on that rail trail, I see so many people walking and so many people riding their bikes and exercising and promoting well being and good health for themselves. I commend whoever was responsible for uh, extending a bike trail from Binghamton University to downtown Binghamton. I think that's also a great uh, project and will promote health and activity in the community. And I encourage whoever was responsible, whoever potentially has input on this, to increase the number of biking trails and walking trails uh, in Broome County and maybe extending into, I don't know, I don't think anybody here is from Tioga, but the rail trail continues from Vestal into close to Oviedo. I mean, that could be extended. It would just, when I'm on the Vestal rail trail, it is so crowded you can't even, you know, make your way through. And I think that would not only, you know, increase the health and promote, you know, the well-being of our community, but it would also attract people to come to this area. When I go to different cities, you know, all these cities have uh, bikes that you can rent, you know, rent them in one place and ride them to another location and then drop them off. We could certainly have something like that here 
if the roads were safe. I personally like to ride my bike from Endwell to Binghamton University where I work. The only six spot for me to ride is on the rail trail. If these bike trails were extended, I'm sure I would not be the only one to take advantage of it. Other people would also. Um, one more quick comment I have to make is about education. Uh, a few months ago, I saw an article in the paper about the uh, lack of people going into the t teaching. Um, and what they decided to do was to encourage more people to enter the teaching field. They were lowering the standards required to uh, be certified as a teacher. And I thought that was like totally the wrong approach. Um, can I just finish? I'm sure there are a lot of qualified professionals here that who have retired early, engineers, chemists, biochemists, that would be willing to teach you know, after they retire from their job, if only somehow the state would make it easy for them to do that. But we have so much to offer to uh, young students. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Ross. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd just like to thank our elected officials for being here tonight. My name is Eamon, and I am here on behalf of the Many Hands Food Cooperative which is a grassroots initiative by both community coalitions in the city of Binghamton to establish a community-owned grocery store in a community called the North Side that has lacked a full-service grocery store for over 20 years now. Um, Many Hands is designed to be more than a grocery store. It's designed to empower people, to teach people, to provide, and most importantly, provide an asset uh, through stakeholder ownership where uh, community members can grow financially and personally from. We, uh, we've been doing a great job getting a lot of uh, money and different funding coming in for our project, but I'm really here to uh, reach out to the state um, representatives to ask uh, you know, to get New York State to help with this process. Food insecurity is a huge issue in New York, and it's even bigger issue in Binghamton. In Binghamton, you have a child poverty rate that is about 47.6%, nearly one in two kids live in poverty. And on top of that, a United Way Needs Assessment Report from last year found that over 56% of families have trouble getting enough food for their kids in Binghamton, which means kids don't learn as well, which limits kids' um, future and their opportunity. And so I would like just to reach out to everyone in this room, um, especially our state senator and our state uh, representative, uh, Rich David, um, to ask what we can do together to help end food insecurity in Binghamton and Broome County as a whole, and possibly even New York. Thank you very much. Thank you. So that was actually everyone who signed up to begin with. Uh, now that we've heard people speak, is there anyone who didn't speak that would like to? Are you going to hold the camera on yourself? No. Do you want me to help out? <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I'm glad to see that we're all very concerned and we came out tonight in this cold weather and the snow and ice. Uh, and I think it's important to have so many people show up. I also want to thank all of the elected officials and the university for having this opportunity for us to be able to speak what we think. I'm sure several individuals here know who I am. My name is Michael Voss. Uh, I'm involved with a lot of politics, but also a lot of the nonprofits in the city. And I'm not speaking on behalf of any of those, but I think it's important that we also mention some of the observations that are going on so that you can take that back to the assembly, to the state senate, and to all of the communities. Because I think that's something that's really essential to get to the answer that we all want to see. We're list I'm listening to everyone tonight, and I wasn't prepared to speak. But something I've noticed, since 1953, our state has lost population every year and every decade. It's cost us congressmen, it's cost us political influence, it's cost us money at the end of the day to be able to fund a lot of the programs that everyone's speaking about here. Right now in the last eight years we've lost one million people. We have lost well over a billion dollars in revenue. That's businesses to employ ourselves to be able to pay for all of the programs we can think of to help everyone. The main thing I want to say about this is what we've been doing since 1953, and as mentioned by Governor Cuomo just a couple of years ago, uh, a focus that we've been keeping isn't working. The definition 
of not working. We have lost a million people in eight years, over a billion dollars in revenue. We need to take a new approach. And I think that if we get away from the idea of competing with California and, and certain other states and focus for a political election, we'll be able to do a lot better for our people. Thank you. Is there anyone else? <laughs> I can never uh, not talk about health care. Um, I work for the New York State Commission for the Blind, and I had clients that lost their vision because they didn't have health insurance. And to me, that's something that should never happen in, in this country. Um, and it's just so sad that we don't get together and uh, come up with a single-payer health plan that would save us so much agony. Um, people wouldn't have to go bankrupt because of their medical bills. They wouldn't have to lose their homes, etc. Uh, it's just, uh, and uh, Assemblyman Gottlieb has uh, uh, got it passed in the, uh, you know, in the assembly three years in a row, maybe four, but at least three. And uh, there are billions of dollars for us to save. Most people don't realize that. There's actually billions of dollars that we could save by providing single-payer single health care program. And there's like 37 other civilized countries that do it. You know, nobody does it perfectly. There's something wrong with every one of those countries, you know. Uh, but they, many of them do a better job than we do. And, and, that's, and that's not right, you know. Uh, the, uh, you know, birth rates are higher in so many other countries than in our country. And it's just sad. And I could go on for a long time with this. And, and I, no, I <laughs> but, but I would hope, you know, we solved, I mean, we started working on really solving together the heroin problem that we have in this county. And I think all of our politicians are to be commended for that. And, and I guess I just want to encourage them to pass a single-payer health plan for the same reasons. That's it. Thank you. Does she use those at home? Oh, yeah. yeah. But, you're done, girl. You're done. I don't pay attention to it. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Garrett. I'd just like to reiterate and emphasize a couple points made by earlier speakers. Uh, one of them would be at early voting reform in New York and just voting reform in general. Our state should make every possible stride to make sure that voting is easy and accessible for every single person. And we really just need to make sure that New all New Yorkers get the opportunity to take advantage of the most basic fundamental right of any democracy, which is to vote. Uh, and then also I'd like to just reiterate the need for serious action to be taken to fight uh, food insecurity, and especially in Binghamton and especially with the Many Hands Food Co-op. Um, I think it'd be a really important and really just core issue for, for this community. As one of the people who actually helped collect the data that was referenced in the study there, I got to talk, talk to a lot of people who were facing this problem, and I can tell you it, it just, it, I cannot get across their words how immensely heartbreaking it is to hear from people who are suffering this way. So I just think we should be striving to take action on that. And there's tons of ways to do it. And this is one great way. So um, thank you for allowing me to speak. Anyone else? Um, I just wanted to follow through on, on the issue of government accountability and transparency. I think that's very important, um, and I commend those representatives who are here who have continued to have public forums um, and have participation by our citizens, um, as opposed to some representatives who have not done that. Um, I re I, another issue is I recently retired and no longer have children in the public school system. And I wasn't going to say anything about this until I heard some comments. 
I, I know that I'm going to be taxed and I, it's okay with me because I realize that a future doctor, fireman, or businesswoman, or even a politician is going to come out of those, that system. We honor the, the great generations before us. I think we need to honor the future generations by supporting the public school system. The other thing is the single payer. This is a crucial issue for me. I have a son who is disabled. He uses the Medicaid expansion. He works. He walked to work because there's no bus service before 9 a.m. in Binghamton. Those representatives who are here, please note that. And he walked with two braces on, on his legs to work. He uses Medicaid expansion and he deserves that. He deserves that. Um, and I think he, it's, we have to look at the issue in terms of real people. So I wanted to point that out about my son. I don't want pity for him. He works, he wants to work, he has a strong work ethic, but he's involved in this political issue of how Medicaid affects him. And he's real. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Is there a hand? Okay, so we're going to circle back around to if you have already spoken. Um, a minute? Can we give a minute to? Is that okay? Just a minute's fine. I, okay. I don't even that, need that much. Okay. I just wanted to get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I want to speak a little bit about legalizing marijuana. I'm against it, and uh, I'll tell you why. Uh, our lungs weren't made to inhale and exhale smoke. They were made for oxygen. And if we haven't learned from the tobacco industry, uh, why would we start over with the marijuana industry? Uh, they say, I heard it said tonight, that uh, 32 other states allow drilling, and uh, that's not a big enough argument to, to, for us to allow it, but yet only other eight other states are allowing marijuana. So how can that be big enough for us to allow it? We shouldn't be allowing marijuana. It is a gateway drug. There are five carcinogens in marijuana that cause cancer. It's not safe, and it's just not good. It, it, it breaks down the morality of our children, uh, our moral compass is already screwed up enough. We don't need to add to it. That, that's about all. Thank you. Repeat offenders? Anyone else? <laughs> <laughs> I never. I never. Yeah, I just want to try to finish my thought. And the whole reason of coming here tonight was that uh, we've committed a lot of money, $1.4 billion through the Regional Economic Development Council. Um, and over those six years, from uh, 2011 to 2016, um, we've only created or retained, okay, we've created 2,200 jobs. We've retained 18,000. And for spending $1.4 billion, that doesn't seem a good return on investment. And I pointed out the high levels of poverty in our area in Broome County. Um, the largest affected populations are children. Uh, when you add in what we call the working poor, the Alice people, it's almost half the people in Broome County. So my point at the end here was to say that we need to look at economic development differently. There's two great reports from the Brookings Institute, which are companion reports. And what we need to do mostly is to create a new coalition of actors within the economic development uh, community. Not just employers, economic development organizations, and chambers of commerce, but community development groups, workforce development, social service agencies, along with faith-based groups, and civic and public institutions. Uh, because the old model uh, is not working, gonna have to hold that stop sign up again, that we really need to be focusing on not attracting the next big business, but we need to focus on education and skill development, innovation, entrepreneurship, and the two biggest deterrents to people gaining and keeping employment are transportation and childcare. Thank you for letting me go over. Thank you. Welcome. A lot has been said about uh, poverty tonight, and I'd just like to express an opinion. Having been 
in Africa and seeing real poverty, destitute poverty, uh, just want to reflect on poverty as a, a state of mind, an attitude. Uh, the poorest of the poor in our country, in our area, have it so well off compared to some of the third world countries that exist today that we need to be thankful for what we've got and encourage people to take responsibility for their actions, for their uh, state, and take advantage of the wonderful opportunities that we have uh, in and out of government, in and out of private industry, and um, well, that's, that's about as much as I can say tonight. I didn't intend to speak. So, anyways. Thank you. Was there another hand that went up? Yeah. yeah. I just want to talk a little bit about uh, heroin addiction. Uh, it's something I experience every day with a member of my family. And uh, what I'd like to sort of envision, I think it would help for a certain percentage of the people, not everyone, that it is you have volunteers or maybe even people who work for the state who would deliver medicine to the people in need, which would not only include like Suboxone, uh, but like uh, if, they're, if they have uh, attention deficit disorder, disorder or some other issue, most importantly, like in, any prescription drugs, to deliver to these people each day, like the methanol clinic they have down over here in the south side, but all the drugs. So they, because a lot of these people, they'll, they'll sell them on the streets, they'll sell the drugs on the street, and if you're going to send everybody to a clinic, you're never going to be able to afford it. It's just, it's just too expensive. And basically, these people know what the problem is. When they go to a clinic, long-term care, they're just here in a reiteration every day of the things that they already know. The biggest thing that they do is give them medicine consistently. And if the person decides to get off drugs, then they can maybe make some headway. Now, some people aren't going to be able to do that, but some will. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Here and then over here. I didn't really get a chance to say too much before, I probably would again, but um, our federal budget has gone way over the board, and we're now 20 trillion in our national debt. I don't think you could count the tr a trillion in your lifetime. New York State cannot print its own paper, so New York State is sort of bound a little bit more. Um, but we're, we're uh, being undone as a constitutional republic. The law is the United States Constitution. Our uh, congressmen take an oath to honor and defend the Constitution. They go into office and they do whatever their party leaders tell them to do. And it's outrageous because now, like I said, we're 20 trillion in the national debt. And you couldn't even count to 1 trillion in your lifetime. And I'm, I'm talking about uh, outrageous. So uh, this is uh, one of the major problems we face as a nation. We're giving away money we don't have to foreign governments. We have our troops in other countries that we shouldn't have them in there uh, under the Constitution. So uh, the Constitution itself is being ignored. So we're being betrayed from within at the federal level. The state is getting itself into a lot of trouble now because they're spending money on things they shouldn't be spending it on under the state constitution. So we put people in office and they take that oath to honor and defend the constitution. When they get in office, they do not honor and defend the constitution. So I think that's one of the critical things we have going on in our country right now. A constitutional republic is no more. We're being destroyed from within by our, the people we put in office. We don't bother to find out what they're actually doing. We just keep voting them back into office. So that's my, my general thing. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you. I just want to say how 
prouder was of the young people in the room speaking, and I hope that we find a way to keep you engaged. State, and I would support any effort you um, undertake to make sure that people have access to voting. I, I think that the things you talked about are great. I also think that single payer health insurance might help us keep you here because a lot of times young people have to take a couple of part time jobs. Uh, and like Suzanne talked about, then it gets difficult to get health insurance. Um, if you have to have two or three part time jobs and single payer insurance and you're voting, I want you here. room knows how many uh, peace and justice groups there are in this area and there are there are several working on issues that we, we spoke about tonight I run a justice and peace resource center and if you're interested in finding out where to contact people I would be happy to help you with that anyone else we've exhausted the room oh, almost thank you <clears throat> I've heard several people say that they're for single pair, pair, pair. I want you to know that I'm totally against single pair. I had to work all my life to get the insurance that I have, which is uh, not what you're talking about. And uh, those of us that had to work for our insurances don't think that insurance should be given to people that have not worked for it. And as for the college students that came, how much taxes have you guys paid? A lot of that, huh? I feel like I have to say something. Oh, hey, give it to me. Well, okay, but we want to keep in mind that you know, people I know, can I know, share I, perspectives. I felt like you were staring at me. So, and you, so I just, I forgot what I was going to say. I think that I think that what uh, the point that was made earlier about taxes. I have kids that left, they left school in '95 and '97. Um, I work in a professional field that relies on a good education. I need nurses. I need doctors. I need therapists of all sorts in our profession, and most of them come and have come through the Broome County school system. And we're fortunate in this area to have a relatively good school system. And besides that, for some of us, insurance and health care is not just a privilege, it's a right. And having a healthy, um, healthy population is really important because otherwise we all pay through our taxes when people show up at the ER without health insurance. We can't turn them away. So it impacts the corporation that owns the hospitals, and it impacts all the taxpayers in Broome County, because we all pay them. Thank you. Can I get through? Can I get through? This will take just two seconds. Uh, I just wanted to thank our elected officials who are here tonight um, uh, for coming, and, and I want to look at the example of the opioid. Um, problem that we have here and I want to compliment them on forgetting politics and solving the problem and I mention that here now because I think there's other problems that we have that the three of you seated there along with Jason and Rich David who was here earlier that if you continue to find issues like take your list up here with your staff and find other things like that that you can have a discussion about and find real solutions to that's what makes this democracy work, and that's what has solved and, and begun to address the issue of opioids here, because you put down politics, and I commend you for that, and you looked at solving problems. So we have a lot of other problems, it's a long list, but if you can prioritize a few more of those amongst yourselves and agree to work on those, I think the community uh, and the entire southern tier will be a lot farther ahead. Um, in the coming years. So thank you again for what you're doing. What he says. <laughs> um, I think we got it. 
I want to thank all of you for coming tonight, but there's a couple of things that I just want to um, talk to you about. One is future public voice, voice events. So if this was something that you think is beneficial, we would like to know. And um, I'll put my email up as we're closing here. So if you wanted to send me an email, uh, if you think there's ways we could do this better, I'd like to know that as well. Um, in addition to that, some of the issues that were mentioned, our college has a way um, of using a national issues forum framing that helps bring people together to think critically and um, openly about how we might go about solving issues. They're called um, community deliberations. On the table over here, we put out some of the topics. Uh, food insecurity is one, for example, that we have a deliberation on it. Lays out possible solutions that citizens around the country have said, we think this might work. And we bring people together to think what's good about possible solutions and what don't we like and what are the trade-offs associated with it. I don't think on the table tonight is one, but we have one called Where Have All the Voters Gone? Um, we're looking to roll that out in the community and get people really talking about what do we do about this issue. Um, so if issues were raised tonight and you would like to hold a forum, you have a group in mind or you think it would be nice for us to do it for the whole community, we're really happy to talk to you about it because as citizens you should drive the issues that the community is talking about. So again, um, take a look at what's over there and if you're interested in things, please send me an email. And I'm going to hand the floor over to Douglas C. Garner to have some parting words. Can I make one I saw, I saw the announcement about uh, this forum in uh, the paper yesterday. I think if you guys advertise it better somehow, you know, more people would come out. Sunday, so, Sunday was the first Sunday. one. Yeah, yeah. Sunday. So maybe, I don't know, on, on WSKG or something like that, or somewhere. This is always better. a work in progress. Yeah, that's a good because point. Because I'm sure that it would be nice to get more voices in here as well. It's great. And, and, um, I don't know, how did you guys hear about it? Um, we heard it from uh, Mike Bauer. Uh, Mark Bauer, sorry. Um, he was the one who told us about it. I'm so sorry. Thank you for coming. Thank you for inviting us. I'd just like to segue to the point that you made. Um, it was really important, the work of uh, Assemblywoman Lopardo, Senator Akshar, Assemblyman Crouch, somebody who's related to me as a county executive, Mark Whalen just left, and 11 uh, of his colleagues, including seven uh, non-committed Republicans to make the opioid uh, project a test to see whether or not this approach is gonna work. Yeah. Don't forget, there's no guarantee that this, you've got money, a building, uh, that this is gonna produce instant wonders. But I think what's really important is I know that the three elected officials sitting in front of me were at the uh, Shenango Valley High School for what I understand was more than three people showing up, or was it standing room only, for a public presentation. The county executive ran at least one or two of these out at, I know, the county library, and there was another one done in the county legislature, legislative chamber. And these were all illustrations of where citizens had an opportunity to say something. Uh, the challenge, I think, to follow up what was just said, is what might be some other issues. And one that I would suggest that all of you think about is what can you do to keep people like myself in my house as long as I can? I'm talking about seniors. And I know that there are bits and pieces of projects but I think that really needs to be sort of codified together. I think you need public discussions. And I think the three state uh, elected officials, I believe people on the county legislature and the county executive, I would like to thank Greg Deming, who I think is still here, uh, Mr. Uh, David. I think all these people would really want to see a good conversation about what we can do to make um, affordable the opportunity to keep seniors from having to be institutionalized for as long as possible. That, I think, is a key issue that transcends generations. And the last thing I'm going to tell you, 
A third of the federal budget is paid out to people 65 or older. That's an interesting statistic. Thank you. All right, well, thank you very much for coming tonight. Um, Please send me feedback. I'm really interested in hearing how we might do this better or what topics could be in the future. Please drive home safely, and I hope to see you again soon.